Reading from Acts chapter 1, book of Acts chapter 1, beginning at the 12th verse. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. There's a phrase that's found here in this passage and understand it's found about 11 times at least here in the book of Acts. It's that phrase, with one accord. With one accord. It means to be of the same mind or to be like-minded. Uh, we associate it rightfully so with the idea of unity. Our society today is far from being with one accord. Uh, we know that. You know, there are deep divisions <coughs> among us in our society, in our nation. And unfortunately, in spite of how Jesus said that it should be, His church doesn't manifest very much of that characteristic either. Followers of Jesus are often far from being with one accord. Now obviously we can point out to all the different factions within the Christian church as evidence of that. We can point to all the the main denominations and then the offshoots of those and the offshoots of the offshoots it seems that, that came along just all the many different groups but it doesn't stop there now you can take one group or one denomination you know and right now the Methodists would be a prime example of that and you find some deep divisions within it but even if you get a group that can agree on the main doctrinal matters you often still find divisions created over secondary things, you know, such as the style of music or what people wear or, or uh, you know, the translation of the Bible that they use or, or even down to, to, I guess, what's become the proverbial issue, you know, the color of the carpet, you know, and things like that. Even when you get groups narrowed down to, to where they believe alike and practice alike in so many ways, in, in, in many ways, there are, there are still little things that we fallen human beings allow to come between us in the way of personal <coughs> preferences and, and people wanting what they want and not willing to budge from it and, and things like that. So many things are allowed to, to get in the way of God's people being and acting with one accord. Now I was doing, I think maybe I told you, I was doing some research not long ago on house churches and looking at Facebook groups about them to see if there were any around here and in the process I unknowingly apparently submitted my name to join one of those discussion groups and because I got a notice saying I had been accepted in as being part of that that group so anyway it shows up now on my Facebook page so I kind of follow the discussions that they have and as I've done that I've been amazed and disheartened at the lack of unity there uh, you know, these are all folks who agree on the benefits of house churches and, and some of them, you know, involved in that, but it seems like they spend a lot of their time debating details that they disagree about. They, they focus on the little disagreements rather than on their more important common ground. And, you know, I'm afraid that's what we all have a tendency to do sometimes. We've all been guilty of doing that. Now, where's the unity that Jesus called for? Where, where's the spirit and the matching behavior that we see here in the early church, here in the book of Acts, behind that phrase, with one accord? I like the note my study Bible has about that phrase. It says, it does not refer to people who all think and feel the same way about everything. Now let's not mistake it for that. It doesn't refer to people who all think and feel the same way about everything but to people who set aside personal feelings and commit themselves to one task. And I believe that's key. 
to be with one accord, we've got to be willing to set aside some of our personal preferences and desires and ambitions. Now, don't get me wrong. Not set aside truth. Not set aside you know, the teaching of God's Word. You know, that's causing some of the divisions today is because some people are doing that. But so not talking about that, but talking about setting aside the secondary things, you know, personal preferences, desires, things like that, and focus on something that's more important. One task, one goal, one thing. We we've all got to see that one thing is taking priority over those less important issues that <coughs> tend to divide us. So in other words, we might say. We've got to rally around a cause or a need or a goal or at least a few main ones or basic ones that supersede everything else. And I wonder, can we do that today as the early church seemed to be able to do? Can we set aside our preferences and differences on other things and focus on the more important issues and join together to pursue those? So, what was it that, if we can put it in these terms, what was it that rallied the troops there in the early church? What did they focus on that enabled them to function with one accord? Well, I went through and I looked at those instances where it says that they were with one accord, and I've narrowed it down to three things. One, they focused on a common need. They focused on a common need. Here in Acts chapters 1 and 2, it says that they gathered and they continued with one accord. Here in verse 14 that we read, and again over in chapter 2 verse 1, there on the day of Pentecost. Why were they all with one accord in one place? What were they doing? Well, it says here where we read in verse 14 that they were praying. And, and, and you know that's right, but were they, were they just praying in general? Was that the one thing they were around, around just having prayer? Or were they praying for something specific? Now why were these 120, we find out there were 120 of them here as we read on in this chapter, why were these 120 followers of Jesus all gathered in Jerusalem waiting and praying? Because Jesus had told them to do that. Jesus had, had pointed out something that they all needed and had told them to wait for it. They were gathered with one accord praying because they had a common need and were waiting for that need to be filled. Well, what was that need? Jesus referred to it as the promise of the Father, you remember. It was the need for His followers to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and to receive the power that they would need to go out into the world and to be His witnesses and to do the work that He was calling them to do. That common spiritual need united them. They were all focused on receiving that promise of the Father, receiving the Holy Spirit in His fullness and power because Jesus had impressed on them the fact that they couldn't fulfill their mission without that. So in these opening chapters, they were it seems laser focused on that one thing. They were waiting and praying for the fulfillment of this promise that the Holy Spirit would come and empower them. What need do we need to be so focused on today? You know, well, we might say revival. You know, we've been praying for revival. And, and yes, we, you know, we throw that word around a lot, but what's really needed for revival. Uh, in some cases, maybe some churchgoers need to get born again and, and really know Christ as their Savior. Or in other cases, maybe those who are born again need what the, the disciples were waiting for here, need to be baptized with and filled with the Holy Spirit so that they have that power to live a life of victory over sin and Satan and to do the work that Jesus calls us to do. Uh, We need that power to be bright lights in the darkness today. The power to be His witnesses. The power for God to work through us to do great things that will show His glory and His power. 
We need the fire of the Holy Spirit to fall on us as it did on the disciples there in in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. We need that spiritual power. So the church today unfortunately fits the description that's given in the Bible where it says having a form of godliness but denying the power. Having a form of godliness but denying the power. We need to have more than just the form of godliness. We need to have more than than merely the man-generated religious traditions and rituals that characterize so much of the church today. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Can, can, can we rally behind that today? Can we set aside all other preferences and things that would divide us and instead with one accord seek a real Holy Spirit generated revival? Beginning with, with us seeking to have our spiritual needs met, whether it's getting saved or whether it's you know, being filled with the Spirit or revived or whatever we need in our own lives. But let's seek that power from on high in us and in our church. You know, focusing on that common need kept the disciples from being divided because they don't think they didn't have opportunity right from the start here. Uh, in this first chapter, what did they do? If you look there, they chose a replacement for Judas. And that was important to choose another apostle. And in verses 15 through 26, we see the process that they went through. Two men were pr- proposed to take Judas's place. One named Joseph and one named Matthias. It wasn't one unanimous choice there. Two were chosen. So you see the potential for some division there taking place. Maybe some wanted one. Maybe some wanted the other one. Well, they prayed about it. They asked God to reveal the one He had chosen. And they cast lots and they trusted what the lot showed to be God's choice. Well, Matthias was chosen and he became one of the apostles. But then notice what you don't see recorded there. You don't see those who supported Joseph getting upset, demanding a recasting of the lot, or start working to impeach Matthias over there, or or leaving to go form their own group, or anything like that. They were too united over the main thing waiting for the promise of the Father to let this issue divide them. Let's likewise be so focused on revival and seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church that nothing will be allowed to divide us. Focus on our common spiritual need. Doing that will keep us functioning with one accord. So what else enabled them? to be with one accord. Well, the second thing that I see here is they focused on a common ministry. They focused on a common ministry. Over in the fifth chapter of Acts, beginning at verse 12, Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 12, it says, And through the hands of the apostles many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed." Now Solomon's porch that's mentioned there, as I understand it, was kind of a covered area there at at the temple. And the disciples seemed to go there not only to continue to participate in the worship with fellow Jews at that point, but to reach out to others there, to share the gospel with them, and to minister to the needs of people. So here it refers to the signs and wonders that were being done and people bringing the sick to be healed by the apostles and things along those lines. Focusing on the needs of others and ministering to them can help us to continue with one accord. Too often it's when we let our focus shift to ourselves 
that divisions surface. If we can keep our eyes on those around us who need the Lord and keep our eyes on reaching out to them, those, those lesser things that can hinder our unity don't seem very important. If we can keep focused on helping others, ministering to the sick, reaching out to the lost, using the gifts God's given us for serving others, it often helps keep us from being divided. We get in trouble oftentimes when we start thinking less about others and more about ourselves, our wants, our preferences. We often lose that one accord when we get more focused on me and, and my church and, and, and maintaining the organization and how it functions to serve me rather than focusing on min our ministry to serve others and to reach the lost and to be a blessing to those around us. We lose the unity when we focus more on the church meeting my needs rather than what might help or edify my brothers and sisters in Christ. We find ourselves with one accord when we focus less on what serves me or serves us as a church and more on what I can do what I can do to serve others. Refocusing on our mission to be witnesses and to make disciples and to show love to people through acts of kindness and through letting God work supernaturally through us and the gifts He's given us as He did the disciples here in Acts. Now today, just as an example, today is our monthly Sunday that we go out there to the nursing home for the service this afternoon. And as we focus on that, you know, I observe that, that there always seems to be that with one accord spirit as we do that. You know, different ones doing their parts. You know, bringing the things that we need for the goodie bags that we put together and putting those together and thinking of other little things, maybe like Valentine cards and such that can go in there. Or, uh, you know, going over there then to the nursing home and, and putting out the chairs, rearranging them, you know, uh, giving hymnals out to the ones who want them and need them, you know, gathering the folks in there for the service, leading the singing, sharing the devotional. You know, many different ones of us involved in that and doing different things. But there's a spirit of unity as we all focus not on ourselves, but on trying to be a blessing to those folks there. And that carries over into other areas of ministry too. Now let's focus on our mission. Let's focus on the ministries that God's given us. Let's focus on ministering to those around us who need the Lord or those who are sick and hurting and, and facing other challenges and problems in their lives. Focusing on our common ministry helps keep us with one accord. A third thing I noticed here in Acts. They were with one accord as they focused on a common enemy as they focused on a common enemy. In Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 23, it tells about a prayer meeting that they had, and it says that they raised their voice to God with one accord. Now in this case, they weren't praying for the baptism with the Holy Spirit because they, they had already experienced that. They were praying for boldness to speak God's Word and to do His work. And why were they praying specifically for that at that point? It was because they were now facing opposition and persecution. Before this, Peter and John had been arrested uh, because they were preaching about Jesus and His resurrection. And uh, the authorities forbade them from speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. It says back in verse 21 of that chapter that they threatened Peter and John before letting them go. Now these were the authorities who were doing that. So Peter and John went back to the other followers of Jesus. They shared what had happened and that's when they prayed with one accord for boldness. They were facing a common enemy in the face of these threats and persecution. Issues like the style of worship or the color of the carpet didn't seem to matter. You know, the threat of a common enemy brought them all together in unity. Facing a common enemy has often brought people together in spite of their differences. It's brought nations together as allies you know, during wars when maybe they didn't have much to do with each other before then. 
Um, but a common enemy brought them together. It's happened in politics and in sports and in other areas of life that people set aside their differences because of the threat of the same enemy or the same opposition. And if we as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, I believe if we would focus on our common enemy, then I believe it would help us to be able to function more with one accord. And we certainly have such an enemy in Satan who is out to hinder us and to pull us down and to destroy us. We have an enemy who is defeated. He's been defeated by Christ, but he's still trying to do all he can to hinder God's work, to take as many people down with him as he can. He's working in the world today to fight against those who are trying to live for the Lord, who are trying to accomplish the mission that God has given them to do. And I wonder sometimes how far it has to go before we today in the Christian church, talking about the church as a whole, before we today in the Christian church will be willing to set aside our petty differences and get with one accord to do battle against our common enemy. I wonder how far it has to go before we can get there. Will it take the kind of persecution that Christians face in some other countries for us in our nation to be willing to come together and to support one another and help each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. So why can't we see it now? Why can't we see it already? There are bigger fish to fry in this world today than the little things that we tend to, to pick at each other about and emphasize and sometimes allow those issues to pull us apart. Now our country is in big trouble if certain leaders get their way today. Uh, we tuned into the Oscars for just a very few minutes here recently, and we were reminded of where some of the influential people want to take our society. I mean, our nation is, is heading in the wrong direction spiritually, and that's going to affect those who are trying to be faithful to God and faithful to His Word. Our religious liberties are in jeopardy. Uh, we're, we're already facing opposition and hostility and, and outright persecution seems to be just around the corner depending on how things go. But we need to see the urgency of where we are and we need to recognize the enemy. We need to focus on fighting against that enemy, praying against the evil and praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praying for courage and boldness as they did here as we read there in Acts, to say and to do what God calls us to in these times in spite of the pressures and in spite of the opposition. We shouldn't be wasting time battling each other over minor issues. We need to be with one accord going against our common enemy. Let's focus on the enemy. The enemy isn't your fellow believer who disagrees with you about what song to sing or or, or what you wear to church. Uh, now there may be some church people who are your enemy, those who are turning against God's Word and the false teachers and preachers and others today who are doing that. But it's not your fellow believer who just disagrees with you about some of these other little things. The enemy is the one who's out to take away your freedom to worship as a follower of Christ and who wants to keep you from being able to live out your faith and who ultimately wants to destroy your soul. Now let's focus on battling Him and those that He's using today. But we too easily, we too easily let things keep us away from experiencing the with one accord spirit that we see here in the book of Acts. So let's commit ourselves this morning to, to focusing on the things that they focused on in the early church instead of the secondary things that divide us. Let's come together with one accord and seek to have our spiritual need met, to really seek revival, to seek to, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's come together with one accord and focus on the people around us and their needs, the people both in the church and outside the church. Can I take my eyes off of me and my needs and focus on ministering to others? And let's come together with one accord to do battle against our common enemy 
who's trying to hinder us and defeat us. No, He would like nothing better than for us to forget about Him and fight with each other instead. With one accord. It's possible. It's not easy. But it's possible if we stay focused on the right thing. Let's pray.